Welcome to the Rooted Healing Podcast, where we seek to deepen our kinship with the living world and with the great mystery that runs through us. This is a space where stories heal with words that weave us closer to our wild and daring natures, bringing together the expansive minds, topics, and ideas that help us heal, reimagine, and co-create the world we wish to thrive in. You know, it's such a paradox, isn't it? Here we live in this highly mechanised world. We couldn't be doing this without this mechanism. Uh, but I know I tasted that. I tasted that that confidence and that, that grounding and that knowledge that one can thrive, absolutely thrive, in that situation, living in roundhouses made of natural materials within the local mile radius and thatched roofs. Uh, all you need is a community of people. Chris Park is a druid, ecological artist, musician and storyteller, immersed and versed in the ancient lore and wisdom traditions of the Isles of Britain. He teaches ancient technologies, experimental archaeology, educational projects, eco-building, professional storytelling, folk music, and he also raises awareness of the heritage of beekeeping, where he is also a host on the Living Being podcast, bringing conversations together for the love of bees. He began working with the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids in 1997, and he hosts seasonal ceremonies within a sacred grove at his home, and further afield as a Druid priest, celebrant and teacher. Chris was in the BBC TV show Surviving the Iron Age, which followed 17 volunteers living as Iron Age Celts over seven weeks of a wet Welsh autumn where they had to maintain their settlement just as the Celts did 2,000 years ago. I watched this show on TV when I was little with my mum and it's really beautiful to hear what Chris talks about because so much of that experience happened beyond what was presented in the TV programme. Chris also guides storytelling and folkloric tours around the ancient landscapes of the White Horse of Uffington and Wayland Smithy, the Ridgeway and the Avebury Complex and Stonehenge, discovering archaeology, heritage, nature and a deeper sense of place. So I hope you enjoy this really interesting conversation with Chris Park. And just a heads up, at the start of this conversation there's quite a lot of rain in the background from Chris's home which doesn't continue throughout the whole conversation. And hopefully it's quite nice hearing the pitter-patter of the raindrops nourishing the land around Chris from when he was recording. It's just started to rain, <laughs> which is good news actually, really good news. Uh, because I spent, I spent the morning collecting kindling and I'm really glad I did it this morning because uh, it'll all be wet this afternoon. It's an organic farm, so we're surrounded by organic fields and I'm in a small woodland, a luxurious hedge, as I like to call it, and lots of beehives. And we have a spring here called the Bathhouse Spring, which never stops flowing throughout the, the drought this summer. It just kept on giving. How does the land you dwell in inform your work and practices as a druid? Okay, yes. As a druid, one develops a deep deep relationship with the land upon which one lives uh, and the land which one belongs to uh, whether it's the land of your blood ancestors or, or not it's like where you are and, and making that relationship with the spirits of place and therefore the, the trees and the herbs and the animals and the, the stars above and the minerals and the culture that uh has existed wherever one might find oneself in the world. That's part of the Druid's work, is just to take off your shoes and your socks and to sink your feet a bit deeper into the place and the, the watercourses and the villages that followed the rivers and the towns that followed the villages and the cities that followed the towns, you know, and, and, and all the culture that came with that. But, but the primary source, I guess, is nature. I, felt, I grew up on chalk and flint. I grew up in the Chiltern Hills. So that's the kind of landscape that, that helped shape me, the dense woodlands of the Chilterns and, the, and all the forms of the flints and the, and, and the nebula and the stars that you see within them when, once they're 
yeah, kind of cracked open and and the rolling hills and all the chalk wild flowers and the and they used to follow the deer tracks through the woods and and then so coming down to the Oxfordshire plains and along a bit first encounters here were like you know even though it's only an hour's drive away it felt quite alien and it took me a few years to kind of then really feel a part of the place because the geology mm. and, the, and the flora and the feel had changed and just the, you know the hilliness which I felt and grew up with had gone you know there, there are downs not far away but they're not so wooded and so it just wherever one travels I think there's a there's a a belonging that it takes a while to cultivate or and that relationship can take a few years and a few seasons I think you know uh, once you've seen the seasons come and go in a place and 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 know the the waters and the taste of the water and the and and the minerals and the forms of the geology and the and the soil and the the spirits of the place that can take a while can't it it can take a while to to really sink in mm. and for you to to really inhabit a place and, and the people too i've been here over 20 years and it's definitely home what were those early seeds did you grow up with druid parents how did you find yourself adopting this particular spirituality that's a great question uh my parents weren't churchgoers there were more folk practices than there were religious practices and one of the biggest events was bonfire night my grandmother you know my often people would refer to her as a welsh witch you know even though she wasn't uh she was highly skilled at spinning and dying and weaving and so there's a lot of craft and a lot of land-based craft growing up and i spent a lot of time with them because my brother was quite ill a lot when i was a child so my mother would stay with him in hospital and my father would be working all the hours he, he could and then I'd go and stay with my maternal grandparents and and so they're just being in their house you know it's like a house that my grandfather built and it was it was wasn't full of the kind of 1970s four mica and, and mgf and all, and all these other sort of 70s 80s materials it was you know brick and flint and, and copper and wood and lovely polished floors and and oak banisters and open fireplaces with, with, you know, with lovely brass hoods and it, it just the smells of the place and the and the activity of the place would be gathering food or or finding you know giant mushrooms and cutting them up and frying them in butter and and, mm. and so they, they when my grandmother uh died she died before my grandfather uh he gathered lots of yew branches covered in wet red berries and just put, put them all around her room on every single shelf and windowsill and bedside cabinet and and there she was this kind of old little well little welsh woman that was, was just shrinking away with all this yew around her and she was just looking out and mostly what she would talk about would be the yew tree out the window that she could see and wanted more of it to sort of come into the room with her so, so there's an interesting family connection to the yew tree there which is one of the druidic trees that the ovates of the order work with particularly it's a totem tree of the the ovate grade we can talk more about that later, that later. Mm. and my mother's was born in wales uh, even though she grew up in england and her middle name is avon which means the yew tree there's a a blessing there about not having been indoctrinated into a religious tradition but having folk traditions i think that's yeah that's arwen our uh, baby arwen we just had a a new born here, mythically uh, born on well around about sunrise <laughs> on the summer solstice this year, wow. as my partner went into labour at sunset. Oh, so beautiful! Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, we we delivered her ourselves in the middle of the house with our own hands. Wow. Uh, interesting. I was talking to a friend, and she shared about a, a, one of her a community being. Uh, carried into the grave by hand by the hands of the community and it felt oh it's really important isn't it that to have hands all throughout one's life and to be touching each other you know and, and that that really simple connection to birth and to death yeah that's really important like my grandmother on her deathbed and wanting all the you the hands of the you to kind of come in and touch her mm. so i'm trying to tie it back into the thread <laughs> of a art is art was the key i i was i was good at drawing and quite creative and so i 
did A level art, and then I wanted to find out where the roots of art. You know, we were given this big book, dumpf, you know, the story of art. <laughs> and of course, the first few few pages were were cave art, you know, rock art and, and Paleolithic art. So I wanted to find what what's the roots of art, and, and I quickly came to the conclusion. And I went on to do a an art degree. I did a fine art degree in sculpture. Um, but percolating as a young sort of 18 year old I was sort of thinking well where does art come from and and I thought oh look at it look 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 at early art it's it's all quite magical and perhaps all art is a magic spell and I thought yeah so look at that look at that the early cave art for the, you know the theory is that it, they were it was sympathetic magic to to appease the the spirits of the forest to be able to hunt animals and keep the life in yourself and, and there were magical pictures of mythical creatures some some of them and medicine people and and then i thought well maybe the first songs were actually poems the first songs were prayers the first poetry was, pro was prophecy and, and prayer the first uh drawings were magical things the first songs were were prayers to you know that the hunter might be plucking his bow and perhaps that was one of the first instruments the hunter's bow sort of plucking the string and singing to the forest and mimicking bird songs and whistles to propitiate the the, the spirits of the forest to, to enable to hunt birds and and the first theatre was like ritual. It was an enactment of myth and an invocation of deities. And so I thought, well, great, you know, that art, all art is magic, isn't it? Even today, the kind of, you find this kind of less salubrious magic of the of the, <laughs> of the marketing industry and, and, and advertising. You know, they're using repetition, they're using symbols and sigils and, and, and music and, and rhetoric mm. to cast a spell on you, essentially. Mm. And so, uh, so then I thought, well, who were the artists of, of these isles? You know, I'm, I'm, I've got, you know, Scottish, Welsh and English and way back a little bit of Irish ancestry. And so I thought, well, who, the, and this is where I live. So who were the native, creative, prayer makers, uh, magicians of the Isles of Britain? So I looked at the the sorcerers and the gruagaks and the and the cunning men and the wise women and the wiccans and the witches and the and the druids and the and the Arwenithion and the and the the Shenikis and all the, you know the ancient traditions and the bards and of course the ovates of the Druid tradition. And so I became really interested in that. And as soon as you start to scratch the surface, you meet all the pagans and all the all the local <laughs> groups yeah. and the wider groups. And I first had a training in the craft in sort of different styles of witchcraft and some traditional craft and later on some sort of more Wiccan style craft and got involved in druidic groups just through meeting people just through going to the landscape and going to sacred places and and finding people doing similar things at similar times of the year and big open ceremonies and then closed ceremonies and, and other little groups around the Chiltern Hills and I, and I gravitated towards druidry I guess because the sort of Celtic roots, sort of Scottish and Welsh roots, as well as Anglo-Saxon roots too, I, I found this amazing group called the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids and began this correspondence course. You get sent a package once a month and it's brilliant. You know, it has all these inspiring words and then these, these practical exercises to do and meditations to do. And I was, a, to be honest, I was a bit away with the fairies at the time and it really, boom, put my feet on the ground mm -hmm. and... and one works with the elements and the in the bardic grade and attuned to the awen. You know, I'd always been a little bit musical, but never really confident enough. And it just gave me so much confidence. And the people I met and the, the gatherings I went to and the groups that I worked with ceremonially, I would recommend it to anybody who's the slightest bit, in, bit interested in the British wisdom traditions is the, the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. It's www.druidry.org. It's the healthiest most creative druid order in the world mm. you'll love it and you can get this introductory pack sent to you that you can work with and if you don't feel the kinship or the the spirit of it really suits you, you can just send it back or if you you know but most people love it and just carry on working through the grades of initiation uh, it has three grades the bardic grade and then the the ovate grade which is the more uh, has more depth and does deeper work into the mysteries of the forest and the mysteries of of all life and, you know the stars above the stones below and the, and the healing arts and uh, mm. and you go deeper into yourself and you know, you, your whole life can kind of dissolve and then be reformed in the ovate grade 
and you come out at the end of there uh, sort of normally keen for the druid grade and then you step into the to the kind of if the ovate grade is like the the kind of the cauldron then the druid grade is like the wand and you step into working in the world in the eye of the sun the community and yeah so it's, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful system it's a wonderful people couldn't uh, vouch for it more i've read about how the music a bard plays is a transmission of timeless wisdom beyond the capacity that language is capable and you're a musician amongst many other things so can you speak to the importance of music when it comes to our spiritual connection or how we relate with each other music and song and poetry and prophecy and prayer and all of these things are at the heart of the bardic tradition in welsh in fact a, <laughs> a newborn uh, has been named awen which is a welsh word a w e n and at the heart of the bardic grade and the bardic teachings is this attunement to this this force it's known as imbas in irish which is a more kind of kind of a hissing fermenting cauldron kind of bubbling up of of uh, this omniscient poetic force that ideally <laughs> the bard kind of attunes to and that omniscience uh, is also found within the awen it's like this this all knowledge this cauldron of creativity from which all art is reborn uh, from where all colors are seen from where uh, truth's worth is measured and <laughs> and all those great things and and so the the the, the ideal <laughs> it probably happens like once in a lifetime but the ideal situation is that the bard is is working and working and training and, and becoming this vessel for the awen and in these moments of trance and these moments of just pure creativity the awen is the force that flows through you and it has this this knowledge about it. it's coming from somewhere beyond you like you know you like you hear a lot of great artists just, just talking about this process or the the epiphany or the the inspiration or the work just comes comes through and so that's the that's the golden moment for the bardic tradition that these words and or, or music or whatever it might be is coming from beyond and it's the it's the perfect medicine for the moment it's the, mm. it's the perfect words that are the the other remedy and the solution for the dis-ease and the prophecy mm. is the guiding force or the or the restorer of hope or the the warning that enables harmony to be restored somehow or misadventure to be avoided so the, that's that's the key really that's one of the bits that hopefully is unlocked through this work in those magic moments mm. I, I, i've touched it a few times in my life i think uh, often it happens for me when i'm when i'm storytelling and it's as if the story is telling itself and it can and, and you do need to practice you do you need to know the story for one it's like you know you need to know the rules to break the rules and then, and then step aside from the rules and allow something to happen and so you get into this space where the where you know, you know the story so well and it just it's telling itself and there's these bits just kind of slip in that you never expected you were going to say mm. and you think oh that, that's interesting and that's just happened i'd never told it like that before is that for this person stood in front of me is that for me because there's some mm. something i need to express here or is it or is it is it just the zeitgeist that's existing in the room is it the those are delicious moments and of course music you know collaborating musically with folks and there's this this spirit which kind of exists there isn't there that you can't really put into words truth can't really be known through words i'm reminded of, of the philosopher schopenhauer who had this, this concept of the will and he said um in its truest form it's music and in its second truest form it's architecture and then when you get into the realms of poetry and writing and text and, and prose it's less pure because it's been formed into a language into it's mm. been abstracted into text it's been never abstracted if it's spoken word it's been abstracted into and, and reduced into a, a particular language and, and word form and is therefore not the truth. It's just how one might view the truth. Mm. And, but what is truer is architecture, because we relate to that in a multi-sensory level. But what's what he considered to be even truer than architecture was the musical arts, you know, beyond words, beyond the the prophecy and the poetry and the and, and the and the song, is the sound. Yeah. Philip Pullman had his. Uh, there's this saying that sticks in my head that he said that. that 
uh, narrative predates language, uh, and you know the, we see it in the animal kingdom. Even though we, they, you know, we could consider that to be a language, but there's a folding of narrative that some people may feel and believe that that just unfolding of the world, and it's how it's always going to be. And, and, and here we are unfolding a part of it and just give it, giving ourselves to it. But any strong decision we make is just part of the unfolding, even though we might think we've got free will. <laughs> I didn't expect I'd be going into this mm. this topic, but but I'm just trying to find and and talk around and maybe find that sort of quintessence of what is what is the awen and what is the what's its purpose and and here we are this is a just you and me having this question and answer is an is an ancient druidic way of teaching and passing on knowledge is the colloquy you know you see it in, in mm. ancient greek ways of teaching and we see it in ancient celtic Ways too. There's a lovely saying which I like to I like to perpetuate is that Welsh is the is the grandmother of Greek, uh, and we know that the Pythagoreans and ancient uh, Mediterranean cultures sent people to the Isles of Britain to be trained under the Druids and the Proto Druids and the you know the, these long lines of of mystery schools that, that go back into the into the mists of the past. I keep bees, yeah, I keep bees, and there are some that say that the root of all music. <laughs> Uh, comes from bees even there's a link between the you know the, the harp and the bee the word telling in in welsh and and the bees there's a kind of there's a interchangeableness there and the sounds of bees and the murmuring of the of these birds before bees were were classified as insects in the middle ages they were before that they were just thought to be birds they were just known as these tiny birds of paradise these tiny birds of sweetness but also venom and darkness and and all that they bring and whatever they bring mm. is medicine, whether it is venom or whether it is sweetness, it's all medicine. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to hear you talk more about the beekeeping and how embedded that is in our ancient folklore and how we, you know, we used to talk to the bees and we had to tell them the important events in our lives. And I know very little about it, but I think it's magical. Oh, it's a vast. <laughs> it's a vast area to talk about. <laughs> you yeah. Do you really want to get me into that subject? Bees, uh, bees hark, hark to your bees. There's a tradition over most beekeeping countries is that a beekeeper has this strong soul level connection with one's bees. And of course, to tell them the news, uh, whatever it might be. A great poem by Rudyard Kipling marriage birth or burying news across the seas all your sad or marrying you must tell the bees mm. and people you know we, we still do it today you'll meet bee farmers and bee scientists and, and just your average beekeeper they'll, they'll be sitting with their bees telling them telling them the news i love that it'd be amazing to hear a little bit more about the sacred trees in druidism uh did i just say that right would you say druidism some people say Druidism. Uh, I think academically you could say Druidism or Druidry. Druidism would suggest a religion mm. and Druidry would just suggest a tradition or a spirituality. Uh, the way the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids teach is that it's open to anybody of any any religion. Mm. So you could be a Christian and become a Druid. You could be a, a Buddhist and become a Druid. Uh, yeah. Druidry is not exclusive to any one way. I mean, most Druids, I would say, are pagans, which is just a, quite a broad umbrella in itself, isn't it? I mean, tre trees are the original cathedrals, aren't they? And it's the original crucifix. It's the original idol. They're the original places of worship. And the, the Druids, uh, we have sacred groves. And groves of Druid, a, a Druid grove can be a group of people. It can be a circle of people, you know, sat in someone's garden or someone's house somewhere. But more literally speaking, a, a sacred grove, a Druid grove is a is an enclosure of trees. It could be any trees, you know, it could be a birch grove or a yew grove or an oak grove or, or a collection of fruit trees. Or, but essentially it's a, it's a place that's dedicated a dedicated temple space, a dedicated place of worship and place of ceremony and ritual. Uh, we have one here on the farm. It's been planted 
over many years we started planting it in the winter of 2000 in the year 2000 I'd been living in an Iron Age village and I just sort of come out of that experience and it didn't feel right to go back into a four walls <laughs> and I came to the farm here to, to help take down a, a sowing camp that had blown down in a storm and I met a guy who just moved into the farm and got a job tree planting so I, I I said, is there any more work going? Because I'd been living in Wales before the Iron Age village experience, working as a tree planter and a seed collector. And we were planting you know, thousands of trees a day, getting like 12 pence a tree. And then I met Tony and said, oh, we get 25, 20 pence a tree here. I thought, great, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm moving in. And, and I knew the farmer, <laughs> I knew, and I knew the farm from the, the camps of the Order of Bards of Ex and Druids that were happening here. So I'd, I knew the place very well and the springs and I got a job here and started planting up this sacred grove in a in a kind of abandoned willow plantation and then over the years various members of the order would come and they'd bring their their kind of totem tree if you like you know so so and so from from the midlands would come down and bring this rowan tree and that's what that was her her totem tree and we'd do a tree planting ceremony and a friend from you know the, the way over east were coming and bring some yew trees we'd plant those and he might stay for six months or a year in a bender over there many different species of tree were planted around the grove and of course at the end of the tree planting season i'd often have a sack full of ash and field maple and hazel and and oaks and things that, that, that were surplus to requirement and you know and, and spindles and, and hawthorns and other things and rowans and so i'd often again put trees around the place and try and encourage the biodiversity as well as you know planting the sacred grove and interestingly now for the past couple of years i've been thinning out and i'm now harvesting some of the ash trees that uh, that i planted it's a really interesting feeling uh, some of them for firewood and some of them for building materials or or crafts a, f- a friend of mine just come back from turkey uh, from a international beekeeping conference called apimondia and she told me a few years ago that in Turkey there's a custom. It's like an old folk, a bit of folklore, like a law, like a common law, which a lot of people adhere to. And that is, you you're only allowed to fell a tree if you're older than it. So you can't fell a tree if it's older than you. Isn't that just such a a humbling sense of respect? Yeah. For those tree beings that are around us that have we're all equals lesser maybe to these beings that can be hundreds sometimes thousands of years old mm. so that so i'm quite happily felling these <laughs> felling some sending out some of these ash trees because I, I you know planted them in my in my early 20s or something um mm. so trees there's a great reverence for trees and the word druid in itself is kind of cognate in, in the Welsh tradition, uh, Darweth. Uh, the word Daru uh, means oaks. And the word uh, Daruen uh, means an oak. And the word uh, Darweth is a druid and it also contains, the second part of the word contains the, the word with. In the Indo-European languages, uh, it relates to the word wid, ved, uh, veda, uh, the word wisdom. So sometimes the the name druid is translated of as the oak wise, or could he, you could even extrapolate it to the kind of the the enduring wisdom, the wisdom of the oak, that tree of longevity and endurance and strength, mm. the strong wisdom, the the deep rooted wisdom. The other many trees, of course, are worked with, especially in the ovate grade. That's when you really go deep into the mysteries of the forest and mm. and deeper into the seasonal festivities as well you know in the bardic grade celebrating the wheel of the year that we call it i'm sure you're well aware of the, the celtic festivals you tune to that and you tune to the elements and you work with the elements and then you kind of integrate those within your being and all with the awen flowing opening to the awen and then you go deeper into that in the, in the ovate grade the totem tree of the bardic grade is the birch tree the maiden of the woods she's often called and it's the the tree of new beginnings in many senses uh it's the pioneer tree you know after an ice age the first trees that will begin to appear 
our birches and they will grow up quickly and then fall down and, and create good soil for the for the rest of the forest to then get a grip onto. But they also initiate fire. You know, that birch bark is such good tinder. You know, it has those good oils in it and you can even get a wet, wet bit of birch bark to catch light if you have a flame. And the besom of the birch sort of sweeps away the old, you know, the birch broom. Mm. So, and, and the word birch, one of the words for birch is beth in the native tongues and, and Bedouin and other. So, but it relates to the birth, it relates to birth, the tree of life and life itself. And that's so it's just so, you know, once you start getting into the tree law, you know, you, you become aware of the of the old oem alphabets. The bird oems and the and the craft oems and the, the milk cow oems, but then the most famous one, the most well used oem and known oem is a tree oem. The first consonant is b in that oem, so that's the, the beginning tree. And then mm. you go into the ovate grade and you work with the yew tree. Uh, my totem tree is a yew tree. I grew up in the Chiltern Hills and uh, have these really old and strong yew groves are dotted around the Chilterns and they're so wind swept and gnarly uh, in the chalk and they kind of unearth the chalk and the flint and and they're great gateways within their themselves and their roots um, we call them cuckoo pens in the Chilterns I think in other parts of chalk downlands I think they're also called cuckoo pens <laughs> mm. often spend whole days in the yew groves through my ovate work I even have some Welsh bagpipes turned from the a yew tree of the bleeding yew trees of Nevern in in mm. in North Pembrokeshire. These trees are, that continue to bleed so the red blood of the yew, like the red berries that like the the roots that go deep into the into our ancestors in churchyards and and, and then once one matures and is kind of reborn out of the end of the ovate grade then we work with the oak tree the oak tree is like that tree of maturity if you like it's the tree that one aspires to become like an oak you know to have your roots deep in the earth and in the darkness and then the water and the nourishment and the history and the heritage and the strength and the justice of the earth and then one becomes this mature tree and one spreads one's branches and casts a nourishment of acorns and, and shelter and service to one's community. So that's the that's what one aspires to do within the druid grade of the order is to become this strong pillar of a community, if you like. Uh, yeah. is that a, a, so, but but this this strong oak. And then to teach mm. like the gospel oak and, and the perpetuating the the wisdom teachings. I love that you have your bagpipes made from the bleeding ewes in, in Evan. I'm from North Pembrokeshire. Aha, uh -huh. you must know it well. And yeah, I also did my work experience when I was 15 at Castle Kentley's. Aha, uh -huh. amazing. So when I was, I think I was 10 when the show Surviving the Iron Age was on. Yeah. <laughs> and I loved it. I remember really wishing that I was in it. So how was it? How was the two months of a welsh autumn <laughs> oh, yeah it was i mean at that time it was the wettest autumn on record but i absolutely loved it and the director he had this nightmare about me whilst we were making whilst we were doing uh, uh, enduring the project he dreamt i was sort of i was on this kind of bed in a straight jacket screaming i'll never find a playground like this again you know and, and, and <laughs> <laughs> because it was just such a delight to be there and yeah. and it's uh Oh, you know, we we went into the project blind. We it was Ronald Hutton who stepped onto a druid camp, a lunacy camp, and, and with these bits of paper and announced that the BBC were going to make this this documentary kind of living history. I forget the word. What is it when you have members of the public in it? Uh, uh, you know, you know, reality, reality or, TV type program, yeah. and they want some volunteers, and they're looking for people who have some knowledge of you know the. Uh, prehistoric belief systems and people have you work with herbs and trees and things like that and so I thought well, that's really interesting and but they didn't do anything about it and then when I signed this my life away in this contract <laughs> and, and and I thought you know we we're going to have to build Iron Age roundhouses and and get a load of firewood in and forage for food and hunt things and when I got there I was just like 
every cell in my body relaxed because there was this, already they you know this this reconstructed iron age hill fort on a on a iron age site had been re reconstructed in the original post holes where the fires were burning you know the, the, the grain stores were full of peas and beans and there was loads of kale and we had animals yeah. and we had clothing and we had a, a, you know loads of firewood and thought this is going to be a doddle this is amazing <laughs> you know here we are we were just basically basically given everything an iron age person would would need and 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 I suppose that all the challenges just came from this sort of human, uh, you know, just rubbing along with each other. And these people yeah. sort of thrown into a situation, uh, probably picked uh, cleverly by the, the researchers, knowing that certain people might not get on with other people. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and the, the experience we had was so different from the programme that they made. I must say that, mm. that they, they only came in like a, a few days a week to film us. And we had a, an on-site camera woman who didn't really get her camera out all the time. She was very respectful. And then we had to make these like little video diaries, but I absolutely loved it. And, it was, and and to be living without any electricity, to be which I touched on, you know, on living on the land and being quite a wild person, and living in Wales and living on Druid camps and and being quite feral, I suppose, in my youth. It really suited me, and I I felt at home. I had this really strong homecoming, and my grandmother lived quite near there she grew up in well, uh, near Newcastle Emlyn in Drevach Villindra and we have this ancestral burial ground in Penboya near there and, and my mother was born in Carmarthen so uh, it was like going to my motherland and, and you know other fathers grandfathers you know so it's like in, in, and I was in the over eight grade at the time so it felt really special and to be working and, and the spirits of the place just came so strongly because we didn't have the mechanism. We didn't have the phones and the computers and the, the windows. So you just, you just, the way you meet spirits and the spirit of place is, is, is so more heightened when yeah. we're not staring at a screen and we're not taken away from our organic senses. And therefore our sixth sense becomes mm. more prevalent when we're not mechanized. Which is, you know, such a paradox, isn't it? Here we live in this highly mechanised world. We couldn't be doing this without this mechanism. Uh, but I know I tasted that. I tasted that, that confidence and that, that grounding and that knowledge that one can thrive, absolutely thrive in that situation, living in roundhouses made of natural materials within the local mile radius and thatched roofs. Uh, all you need is a community of people. And some animals, and 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 the knowledge to farm and create and make. You don't have to make iron. You, know, you can live without. You can live in the Stone Age if you wanted to. But you know, it, it, we 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 did make iron, and we, we were we were reliving the Iron Age, and we're so immersed in the elements and the wind direction and the weather and each other and the phases of the moon and the natural rhythms and and we didn't go anywhere. We didn't for seven weeks. We we didn't go. We were like a couple of times. We went out of like this mile radius. You know that was it. So just to mm. be, just to be stillness. Or it was mostly it was, we were very active. You know we had to we had to keep fires going and, and make our own food every single day. But just to be home and belong yeah. to that hill and the the rivers and the springs that flowed around it and the landscape and and Carningley in the distance and the and the and the knowledge of the turning of the seasons and and the the autumn or uh, the equinox turning into to. Nos Kalins or, or, or Samhain or, the, or Halloween mm. and feeling the, the drawing of the nights coming in and how that affected our animals and how that meant we slaughtered more animals and, and how we were being with that whole process of keeping the life in ourselves and the hazelnuts ripening and the, the fungus and the fungi and the, and the fishing and the, the fires and the, and the being together and the ceremonies and the full moon and and one of the most remarkable moments was welcoming in this other tribe, you know, and it really gelled mm -hmm. us together as a group, actually. There are a few sensational moments, but I loved it and I hardly had any shoes on. They gave us these really terrible leather shoes based, you know, that had been recreated from a find in a sort of Belgian peat bog, or something, you know, a yeah. burial, you know, there may have been slippers or shoes that were just made for burial, they were you know, as soon as they got wet they stayed wet for days you know it's much Ugh, better yeah. just to not have shoes on and uh but i think they would have had some decent good, good hobnail boots or something with a, with a good yeah. sole but it was just a, just a i i had been a goat herd in in provence and worked with goats before 
so I, I was one of my responsibilities was to to look after goats and make cheese uh, I'd done a bit of metal work before so I I also teamed up with the smiths and we made a furnace and we actually made iron which is just wonderful I became interested and became initiated and started training in druidry not to relive the past as a contemporary nature-based nature-loving spirituality as mm. a contemporary spirituality that has its roots in the ancient past but is really relevant to today looking to the past to look to the future and unshackled from patriarchy and monotheism and all the unhelpful things that came with that but then I got suddenly found myself in this experience of working deeply with ancestral traditions, working deeply with ancient technologies, natural crafts, primitive skills, ancient technology, uh, all of it, you know, uh, and the, the storytelling being the ancient tech. So that was our, we didn't have many musical instruments. We had to make our own. So story and song and ceremony were like, it was like our evening entertainment. And, and it was wonderful. And people got the magic and the, and the spirits came strongly to greet us. Mm. I, so I didn't want to leave at the end of that project. I really didn't want to leave that Iron Age village and, and uh, have kind of sort of been trying to recreate it ever since in my life. But, uh, and uh, so that then I came out of that experience to this farm and a friend of mine, Mike Fairclough, who's quite a really funky uh, headmaster down, down in Westerise School in, in Sussex, writing these amazing books on, on you know, children and his teaching and wildness. Uh, at mm. the time, he was te- he was a deputy head, someone near Aylesbury, and he said, come and talk to the kids about your experience. And I felt, like, oh, yeah, this is, I can. This is, this is really valuable. And I could then somehow pass on a bit of what I learned, a bit of the experience that I'd had to folks in younger generations, but also special interest groups of adults and druid camps and people that were interested in you know, the ancient technologies and primitive crafts. And I started living here, built Iron Age huts and mm. felt of value to the community and, and environmental groups and people that wanted to learn to work with bones and skins and trees and herbs and, and ceremony. And we planted the grove and started having you know, seasonal ceremonies here and bringing people in to, to be close to nature and closer to ourselves and and be inspired uh, in that way I suppose I've been doing that ever since and then there's a certain point where the fellow druid was living here JJ Middleway is his druid uh, tag and he uh, lived here for a while in the yurt and we started studying the stars we began to view the night sky as one giant beehive domed beehive and we, we were looking at the stars as constellations and and mm. sort of feeling into the folklore of bees and the folklore of stars and, and how they're interrelated and, and and honey and he used to be a beekeeper at Highgrove and he he gave me some of his old kit and we started re- started to refer to this sacred grove here as the grove of the bee and or the bee grove and we started to teach that kind of wisdom and the bees arrived and they've just been growing ever since and that, so I've sort of been for the last I don't know 15 years I've been concentrating on working with bees and the medicines from the beehive not exclusively but that's been a big part of what we do here mm. but, it, but that gives you such a deeper relationship to trees and and the and the season and, and the forage and the making of mead and all the stories and and these isles are once known as a uh, Avellanus which is the, the honey island I think it's really magical the life you're you're living and I think we all there is a massive remembering and returning at the moment and everyone's yearning for that just simplicity of being in community and sharing story and song and cooking together and being close to the land because that's it's the lack of that that I think is causing all of the problems <laughs> <laughs> well yes I suppose so I mean you're right yeah of course it is and um, but we're, we are also blessed to have what we do have today, this lifestyle isn't so easy. You know, mm. fetching wood, just keeping yourself warm in the winter, living off grid, uh, being close to nature means you're also close to um, harvest mites, you know, and fleas yeah. and rodents and, you know, having to worm the kids every six months or whatever. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, you, you, it's, like there's, it's not all sweetness and light. You know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, 
it, it's really nourishing, incredibly nourishing. I think I'd struggle in a city or a, or a suburbia or something. Maybe I wouldn't. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm here because it happened and it just unfolded this way. I do feel a real strong connection to Wales whenever I'm there. Mm-hmm. And part of me kind of feels like I'm, maybe one day I might end up back in Wales. I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's so elemental, but this is just a lovely, a lovely place to be. And it's on a gap. And, 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 and so I keep on returning. I keep on letting go, and I keep on returning. Um, yeah. Like theoretically, and and the chat book keeps growing. Wales calls me back to. I grew up on a farm, and my mum worked in conservation, so I had a very wild childhood myself and I I do find myself being called back and I felt very connected to the spirit of that land as well as a child without being without putting language to it and the big part of my healing when I went to Latin America was sitting in ceremony and being taken back to the farm and to the that sense of otherness and awe and how supported and held I realized I was by that land it was so beautiful to be shown that. Mm. Yeah, and one has to go away to come back to realise the value of it, I think. I'm a firm believer that whatever you need, or the medicine you need, is right within reach and right under your feet. Yeah. Wherever you find yourself. And I'm not saying don't travel. I'm not saying, you know, but wherever you're walking, wherever you're walking, mm. it's there. And, and once you open yourself to the spirits of place, they come to meet you with such such celebration yeah (laughs) yes we're here we're just waiting for you to return we're really happy you've come back to us and uh there's so much to do and you know within the within druidry you can't do it all you know so some person might just be the most exquisite bard and that'll be their path and another initiate might really get into herbs and healing and that'll be their path and someone else might really come into kind of being teaching the druid wisdom and hosting a, a grove and, or and other folks might you know like, like me i might some folks might get really into bees and beekeeping and the and the mead and the medicine and the honey and the venom and the propolis and all those things and mm. or becoming a orchard grower or a teacher or a farmer or, or a doctor or, or a poet or an artist or whatever it might be that you can't do it all you just you, and that's the that's one thing i really love about the order of bars of eights and druids as well and it really cultivates one's there's no dogma so you're encouraged to follow your path in the in, in a way that you you find your way through the forest and the, the magical places that you're drawn to and the and the beings that come to you and the and the crafts that, that you start to inhabit and perpetuate uh, are succinct and, and synthesized with with you and your soul Mm. keep finding your way one of the biggest aspects of the teachings i've been immersed in i think this is universal is around the holiness of water the vitality the memory the wisdom that water holds and there's a couple of things i'd love for you to speak to one is your pilgrimage of peace and the other is your multi-faith water prayer ceremonies that you've been holding. So wherever you want to go. Okay, well let's start with the pilgrimage, I guess. So there's a, there is a spring here, and I met it ceremonially, which is a fantastic thing. <laughs> From the Druid camps happening here, we would have these ceremonies that would involve us moving through the landscape and and druid priestesses would would become and and be uh have have got the spirit of the spring invoked into them and they'd sit by the spring uh allowing the goddess to speak through her and that would be that would be one character that one might meet within this ritual you you would wander through this ritual landscape let's say you come to the spring and this goddess all encompassing would come and welcome you and then wash you and then and then give you guidance and then you'd move on to the next part of the experience so you know what a wonderful way to meet a, a, a water source yeah. and coming from the Chilterns uh, there are a lot of springs around the edges of the Chilterns and very few in the middle when the Ro- when the Romans came to Britain they actually called the Chiltern Hills a desert and the, because it's the water just goes through the chalk and the aquifers, aquifers exist underneath 
and then knowing Wales, you're never far from rushing water in Wales, are you? So, it's, so mm. to then come to this land, which is on uh, coral limestone, and to know this spring and, and to be drinking from this spring, and then to end up living here and have this relationship, coming out of the Iron Age experience and not wanting to get back into plumbing and all that sort of stuff, and just wanting mm. to have that. So, so blessed then to continue that relationship directly with the spring, knowing that the prayers that I made at that spring and whilst collecting water and the songs that I sing there and it, that, that that spring is flowing into the through the Penny Hooks Brook into the River Cole and up to Coles Hill and then down into the Thames Valley at, uh, close to Inglesham and Letchlade and then flowing all the way through the Upper Thames Valley to Oxford and then Reading and then London and, and off to the North Sea so that, that having those feelings of, of connection to the the water cycle in the spring from birth to death or, or rebirth into the ocean into the North Sea I had this strong feeling whilst I was making a coracle or a curra which is a circular boat circular ish boat flat bottom boat coppicing willow and and making the frame out of willow and I got hold of a horse hide and was tying cutting bits of the horse hide to make uh, cordage and then tying up this horsehide coracle and this was happening one summer and it was the same summer that the seven seven bombings happened in london and as druids we begin ceremonies with a proclamation or a question is there peace and a, and a, and, mm. a, and then a call for peace and a, a proclamation of peace in, in welsh and so i was just tuning into the spirit of the horse and of course this is below the the Uffington horse and feeling and I get this feeling that oh this this coracle is it, it's it's going to do something it's going to there's something that this coracle is being made for and I, at the time I had this round this couple of roundhouses here and one of them is, is the spirit house and I was working really closely with these particular spirits in this house and sort of tuning into how I could be of service as an ovate in the overt grade to the spirits of the order and the spirits of this this landscape and and the world and and then it felt like gosh yeah then I took this coracle to a to a camp a druid camp up the road and I was looking for I thought this boat's going to carry something important this boat is going to carry something and this vessel is out of my hands this whole process is like I'm just a, at service to this wider whatever's going on I just felt uh, blessed to be part of the process to be the mm. human side of it and so I, I invited a lot of people and druids on this camp to sit with some clay and make and we we had a meditation with the coracle and sang these old scots gaelic songs about grace and coracle and and tuning into the the symbolism of the coracle and how the some of the initiates were sort of sent out in cardigan bay without a without a paddle and it had you know as a kind of initiation to test their faith knowing that you know oh. the kind of the monks knowing that the, the elder monks knowing that they'd be washed up somewhere a bit further north upstream <laughs> that the tide the tide they'd be taken out of the tide and back in again uh, but some people are actually going right out to sea and and some of the early irish celtic monks would just set out in a boat and not knowing where they go and put their their selves in service to the to the gods or to their christian god and the saints and where they landed that was where they meant to that's where their mission was i think mm. uh so there's all, all of that involved in just the, the the symbolism and and the heritage of the coracle itself plus the fishing and the and the and the food and the estuaries and the tides and all those things and many people made eggs that's the most prominent form within this this kind of clay creative workshop was lots of people made clay eggs and i had at home, a couple of ostrich eggs that I've been working with. One, I've sort of been carving this snake around the edge, you know, like the like the kind of orphic egg from the uh, from the ancient mysteries. So it felt like this this coracle was going to carry an egg, and I knew I wanted to take it on a pilgrimage, and I knew that I wanted to create some kind of artistic, magical response to the seven seven bombings at this strong moment of cultures being in conflict, you know, religions and and cultures conflicting. And I felt like I wanted to try and help the situation through this pilgrimage by taking a, making it a peace pilgrimage. 
and I thought, okay, whoever I meet, and I didn't feel impeccable enough to carry peace within my being. So I thought I need to take something with me that's going to hold peace. And so I thought, great, it's going to be an egg. So I opened up the top of one of the eggs. And I thought, great, I'm going to carry this ostrich egg from the source to the sea along the River Thames. And everyone I meet along the way, I, I invited them to, to hold the egg and make a prayer or make a, just a wish for peace if they weren't religiously minded or didn't believe in prayer. You know, just, just mm. to kind of hold it and, and think about peace. And some people li- li- wrote little prayers and popped them in the top and some people got to put stickers on and and everybody I met along the way, apart from, a, I think, a Christian Baptist minister who said, sort of, sort, of, sort of shouted, the only way to peace is through Christ or something like that. I think every, every, <laughs> every, other than that, every single person I met along the way, you know, from the tiniest child to the, you know, the, the kind of most um, tooled up police officer or the kind of the, you know, the, the kind of most aloof gangster or, or the, the most happy couple in their yacht or whatever, you know, or... or, or river going boat everybody got it you know i think they were just completely disarmed by this by me sort of you know with this peace flag uh and a, and a top hat with a fox tail on the back and 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 and, and they just kind of they just thought wow what's this coming along <laughs> and i just said hey here's an egg you know this is a program of peace everyone i've met so far has made held the egg and made a wish for peace and so i just wanted to move along the thames uniting cultures and muslims made prayers christians made prayers uh, Jewish people made prayers, uh, Buddhists made prayers, children, grandparents, holiday makers, boat owners, festival goers. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience and, and lots of magic unfolded along the way. The night before I lowered the, the car crawl into the waters here, an ex-girlfriend who we were only together a few months, she phoned me up to tell me she conceived, or we'd conceived a child. <laughs> you know, we'd, we'd been separated for for four months or something like that and so you know it was this this really strong forces were, were working and, and um and she was in oxford and and i was you know on my way to oxford in the boat and and there was this kind of you know the, the really emotional strong things happening and of course you know the the, the serpent and the egg and, and the thames and father said and i think i just entered the druid grade that summer or something like that and so the, oh, it, was, it was a it was an amazing experience, and then part you know, finding myself in the docks in London next to a arms fair was a surprise, mm. you know, and and then finding myself, you know, heading through the Thames Barrier in this tiny little boat next to massive, massive things coming the other way was a surprise. Uh, just doing six knots without even having to paddle in the water on the outgoing tide, uh, reaching the ocean on World Peace Day, wow. not the ocean, it's the North Sea on World Peace Day, and then the the North Sea being as still as a lake and getting a lift out with some lifeboat men sort of two miles out to sea and just dropping it into the water and making these final prayers and then uh, coming home as a, as a father back to kind of, <laughs> you know, which really you know, changed my life, you know, and I've, I've had quite a few kids since, but that was a, it was a really strong process. Wow. And, uh, and it did it you know i think it i think it worked <laughs> i know about it and the spirits that were kind of carrying me and carrying that whole journey and the people that supported me along the way you know especially the friends that helped with the media and and just helping feed me you know and meeting me at various places along the way and and and, and arranging for me to meet like yuri geller or or or, or have a chat to a radio station <laughs> uh feel like always indebted to the people that kind of really supported the project and got it and, and the prayers and the wow how long did it take you four weeks i think it's probably quicker walking because you know the thames <laughs> yeah. does, does this but, yeah. so it's probably quicker to walk the thames path yeah. i'd love to have the time to, to do that again you know uh but you know, when you have children and you make a home and you have bees and, and <laughs> then things change, you know, and you have more responsibilities and commitments. And and I suppose I have matured through the Druid grade. You know, it has matured me. I've uh, become a much more responsible, just being a parent, you know, uh, I've become a much more responsible uh, person and adult. And I, I'd, and I had been used to hosting these water blessings and multi-faith ceremonies. I got really into 
springs are sacred places and 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 i i kind of learned and, and through my studies that that water is like the common denominator to all spiritual traditions whether it's just used in, in ceremony or, or it's a mythological river or whether it's uh it's uh used for washing or initiation uh, it's the it's the common source of all spiritual traditions and it's a common element and i began to visit all the springs around the children hills and the holy wells in the wider area and i, and I wrote this little book called the sacred why about one of the rivers that i grew up with the, the why in the chilterns not the why in in monmouthshire and, and and herefordshire and looking at it as a sacred space and 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 kind of re-fostering those sacred relationships to water and i began river blessings i think the first was in like 1989 or something i think it was 1998 we did this river blessing of the river y in high wickham and all the pagans came and i thought wow this is brilliant there's so much more that could be done and, and you know saint i think of saint hugh of lincoln eradicated well worship in high wickham and throughout the land you know to try and get rid of this old pagan custom you know because wells were dressed and, and worship and prayer happened at wells but they wanted to get rid of this old pagan practice so they eradicated it made it illegal whatever in the eyes of the church and they to try and get everyone to go into the church to worship so i thought that's a bit naughty let's do something about that let's let's yeah. and there was a in High Wycombe, this place called Holy Well Mead, where the well worship was happening. So we did this river blessing at Holy Well Mead on the River Wye. And before we did the blessing, we picked, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of bags of litter, you know, to, to sort of consecrate the space practically and, and, and spiritually. And we worked with the local environment agency. And since then, you know, parts of the Wye, Wye were un, were deculverted, were opened up again, and the river banks were encouraged to to support more biodiversity. And then I thought, okay, this this really works. People are keen for this. And and how about we then start to do multi faith ceremonies, not not just a pagan ceremony, which would exclude other people to do this multi faith ceremonies. And so I kind of I took my druid hat off, um, maybe quite cunningly. I took off my druid hat and asked someone else to wear the druid hat and someone to wear the kind of Wiccan hat and someone to be the Buddhist hat and someone to... Mm -hmm. And so I invited sort of spokespeople and, and leaders from all the religious traditions that I could find. And it's very, really diverse in High Wiccan. And there were Sikhs and Muslims and Baha'i and, and, and Jews and, and, and Christians of many different denominations and, and Hindus, uh, all represented at this magical moment where we were, we were stood around a Roman amphora, you know, this, this symbol of water, and invited folks to kind of come in and, and make a speech from their tradition and then place a symbol of, the, of their religion around the altar. And this magic moment of peace and mutual acceptance happens. Mm. A Jew and a Muslim just having dialogue, listening to each other. And that might seem quite trivial this day and age, but back in, you know, the 90s and the early turn of the turn of the century it was wasn't quite you know it was, it was a thing you know and, and um maybe it still is in some parts yeah these moments of just being together and, and multi-phase ceremonies seem to work and i it's a lovely format and a kind of from then i just encourage other people to do this the similar things yeah and i don't know i'm not sure how necessary it is now but it felt really necessary in those years and the ripples from those ceremonies kind of spread out and touch. You know, once you invite, you know, a, a rabbi didn't come, but a, a, some, the rabbi sent someone and you've got the, the leader of that Muslim group and, and, and these Hindu people and these Baha'i people and these Orthodox Sikhs and these other people, you know, Orthodox Sikhs do work really closely with water. And other people that were um, used to kind of putting coconuts in the river taps, you know, yeah. and these kind of Muslim, Muslim traditions and, and pagans and witches and druids and... An atheist. Who, whoever, an atheist, yeah. And, and other people that would just, just stand in a circle, scientists who just know the value of water, you know, mm. but, but to all stand and and accept each other's way, then those ripples go out to those communities. And and, mm. and I felt like the work was done and the big ripple yeah. was sent. And so that felt really good to have this kind of open circle and to cater for more than just the kind of niche and nerdy druids in our white robes and, and the, the bardic grove and the, and the ovate grove and the druid grove kind of thing. And then somehow I got plucked out of this hedge. A good friend, a man called Ben Christie, kept, you know, knocking on my door, sending me emails. And 
And eventually I, I sort of answered it quite strongly and went out to, to be part of this group called the, the Wisdom Keepers and, and they were doing this pilgrimage and, and this other event called Re- Reigniting Ancient Ways. And I, I was suddenly stood in a circle with some Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal people, elders and, and some Merikama from from Mexico where, you, where you've been and some some mm. other people in the in this, this tribe from the deep Amazonian forest and then you know, people that were initiated to Sangoma then got involved in their medicine festival and meeting lots of folks like yourself who've been far and wide uh, having experiences of indigenous traditions in other countries and then coming back to Britain and looking for something uh, in the landscape that you that created you and that you belong to and perhaps is part of your ancestry as well. Can we talk a little bit more about this land? Perhaps you can speak about the stone circles and what they might have meant to our ancestors. Circles are are temples, aren't they? And and I would say that I'm I'm thinking of the HS2 that cut through the Chiltern Hills on its way to Birmingham. And a silver lining of that was it unearthed this timber circle on the edge of the Chiltern Hills where there's not much stone and you get a bit of flint and the odd bit of pudding stone and not much sarsen actually in the Chilterns, Some unless you really dig deep but they don't kind of come surfacing out like sarsen's stones are like whales slowly through, swimming through the chalk and they, they surfaced a lot you know near here near Avery and Stonehenge and the Grey Weathers and the, and that's why they were used but uh, in the Chiltern Hills uh, this, they, they unearthed this site of a massive timber circle the size of Stonehenge aligned to the summer solstice and it, I just had this aha moment of like, gosh, yes, you know, uh, timber circles were just as prevalent and as complex and as amazing as stone circles. It's just they haven't lasted. Yeah. All across the Isles of Britain, you have areas where there aren't stone circles because the stone wasn't there. Mm. But there were timber circles. We know before the Stonehenge complex and the Avery complex, there were timber structures and especially timber circles. The ceremonial circle is something that's universal to all indigenous wisdom traditions. We all have this this sacred circular space, perhaps with a fire in the centre. You might call it grandfather, you might call it sacred, you might whatever you have in the centre. The sacred centre might be an altar, might be a spring, generally it's a fire. And then honouring the cardinal points of the compass or the four directions or elements or spirits of the circle and, and what's around you. So that is this like universal symbol that during the megalithic era in Northern Europe and, of course, Britain and other parts of the world, was then developed once we had the kenning and the will to develop these stone monuments. So they're still with us as stone circles today. And, you know, the hinges that sometimes they come along with, which is the the ditch and the bank around the outside and sometimes avenues and metering the stations of the sun and the mansions of the moon overlay older sites of perhaps enclosures or causewayed enclosures these ceremonial sites from the that didn't have standing stones but had burials and we can see how the through the art through the archaeological record we can see that the some of these places the the density of offerings is greater towards the center so the center is like the the holy of holies and the circles demarcate mm. the way one might move through a space or or the space gets more sacred towards the middle And they're wonderful places to work, whether it's a circle of stone or a circle of trees or just a a hilltop with a circular horizon. So the circle is really important. I often call the Isles of Britain the land of circles because at a period in history we had round houses, circular houses, circular enclosures, circles of stone, Arthur's round table Mm. and uh, circular boats, circular beehives. But of course, it's not exclusive to the British Isles. Mm. So these were places that when one is looking for a deeper connection to nature and to the spirits of the land and ancestral traditions and the elements, uh, people often gravitate to stone circles because they are places of power and they're often built on places of power and they can give you great reference and great connection to the to the rhythms of nature and the, the, the movement of the sun throughout the, the solstices and the, the swinging of the pendulum of the stations of the sun along, along the landscape and the the movements of the moon and of course the stars before that and all the archaeoastronomy and and giving one 
a circle of community to work and the prayers that one makes in these places can be extra special, like every sacred space that's, that's dedicated. I did become involved in the group, uh, the Megalithic Order of Druids, uh, which was founded by Ivan Macbeth, uh, who's no longer with us, but he did create sacred space. He got really into building with out using any mechanism so we were just using ropes and wood and levers to to move the stones around it felt more special and more sacred and more, more sensitive to the stones and the spirits of place so the stones would move slowly into place mm. and we gathered together for a month to start one stone circle one big stone circle in down in um at Hascombe hill in surrey and then we only put four stones in place and then we came back once a month to put more in and then we just kind of got the megalithic calling and other people asked Ivan to build stone circles and I would often go and be part of his team and help and and really enjoyed that kind of sense of temple building the Celticity if you like of Druidry and the and especially when when the in the Irish Gaelic and the Scots Gaelic traditions of Druidry and the the Goidelic Celtic speaking myths came a bit later the Brythonic traditions seem to be more deeply rooted in the British Isles and the Druidic tradition has that, that taproot going way back, way, way back. And the temple building that then overspilled and you can sort of sniff and smell and some uh, in the sort of Freemasonic traditions of building the temple, even though that's been fueled with a lot of uh, symbols and wisdom from the East, you know, those are kind of Solomonic traditions. There's that deeper temple building and, and circle building and the revival of Druidry. Uh, was helped greatly by the Masonic traditions who wanted to get out of the lodge and and worship in the open air again. The, and in, an industrial revolution was happening. So they saw the the ills and the ill health and the disconnection of the industrial revolution. And the early Druids kind of wanted to restore the, the kind of native wisdom of the British Isles and started to, you know, and, and famous people like Keats and, po and poets and, and the other ceremonial orders and magical orders like the golden dawn and, and, and uh, there's, there's these groups that of artists and and magicians that were working strongly to kind of revive and this has been going on for 400 years this is this is nothing new. you know I'll, I'll see people on podcasts or on little videos saying oh we need to get back in touch with the, our native wisdom yeah. this has been happening for a long time people have been, have been doing this for a long time you just gotta look and you'll find orders like the order of biodiversity and druids and 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 groups that have been working and the, and the kind of you know the Wiccan traditions that have been tapping into you know European and other systems of magic but but rooted deeply within the Anglo-Saxon traditions and you know, it's all here for for the enjoyment of for, and, and when you give yourself to a tradition it's a wonderful thing and, and, and it really begins to then speak through you and through what your work is and you you won't find two druids the same. They'll, they'll be working a different aspect of the order. But together we make this strong woodland and forest. And that's the great thing about about the community that we have. If you're interested, again, it's druidry.org. And just you know, like everything, it's got a website, hasn't it? But that's just the you know the gateway, delicious light that comes off your screen to really get you off your screen and back into into the immersion of, of the elements and the world around you. enjoying the show please rate and review we are still collecting a magical altar set celebrating indigenous craft to give away to our winning review and it just really helps us grow as we're a new show finding our feet or should i say finding our roots <laughs> visit rootedhealing.org to learn more about our work gatherings mission and upcoming online opportunities to gather and grow together 
I'll be announcing the winners for our previous giveaway competitions on social media in the coming days. So follow us at Rooted Healing Co. on Instagram. And if you still want to enter to win Tree Car's book Dreams or Isabel Chu's Breath Cards, as well as have access to lots of exclusive content, you can support this show at patreon.com slash rooted healing by becoming a patron from one pound a month. And if you're unfamiliar with this platform, it's a really amazing, easy to use platform for creatives to share content within a membership. Chris Park is sending me a copy of his book and once I've read it myself, because I didn't come across it in my research before this interview, I will be doing a giveaway for that as well. I just want to share all this nourishment and provide a space for us to chat and connect and deepen our healing journey. And my goal is to have enough support from my patrons so that I can pay someone to professionally edit this show because I'm currently doing it myself and sometimes this takes me two days per episode. And that doesn't include, you know, researching and the actual interview process, that's just the edit. And I'm sure that a professional would probably take four hours and do a better job. So if you want the audio quality to improve and you want to help me keep going and bringing these conversations to your ears, do consider joining the family and showing up because it really makes a difference and means so much. I'm your host, Veronica Stanwell, and we have ongoing music contributions from Mike Howe, and in this episode, some flute melodies from Chris Park himself. Thanks for listening. <laughs>